what I'm really trying to do is I own my things, they don't own me. He's like, you are taking pride in this stupid thing. That is a very hard thing to overcome, but I believe that that mentality is correct. You're gonna piss people off. In order to achieve anything on a large scale, there are gonna be a lot of unhappy people with you. But anyways, yeah, I'm just, I, I don't, it's, I'm only like four days in, so I, I don't, I haven't got the withdrawals yet, but the, with the withdrawals will happen. From what? Not, not exercising. Oh, you're only short. four days in? So this is the second time I've done, like my foot's all bruised up and, and everything. Uh, so like, I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm not, I'm actually like, I decided to think about it. Like, okay, the marathon is like, how long can I go and not lose my mind? That's a good way to think about it. Do you see Casey broke three? Uh, three hours on the marathon. I did see that. That was, was a great crazy. video he made about it. It was. It's really cool. He's like hardcore. Like he runs, uh, like a lot. Do you know who Sahil Bloom is? Uh huh. He's a he buddy of mine. Here, right? No, he doesn't live here. Oh, but he, he started training, and seven months after training, he did two fifty-seven. A marathon? Yes. That's nuts. Nuts. Which marathon? Or did he just just twenty? No, no. Months? He did a he did a real race. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't remember, but he did uh somewhere in boston or something not the not boston but somewhere around there wow he did it and uh i would he told me he was going to do it and i was like no you're not you're not going to be able to do that and yeah. then he ran 1745 in the 5k do you, you a lot of people are very big on goals i don't really do any fitness related goals whatsoever. i don't think he had a goal he was just like working out and he was like i'm going to try this race let's well, i guess it was a goal but it wasn't like he was just like this is fun let's yeah. just keep going uh you had something you were doing the combine or something did yeah i do, do it? yeah yeah i How did, did really well i i did average for a wide receiver really yeah but so look, walk me through this i'm a div are we recording Is yeah, that, yeah, we yeah we're i'm i was a division one track and field athlete so okay. it's not like i roll up roll out the couch like i was built but how long ago was that years ago but i still yeah. trained for it like yeah. I, I still like work out and i and fast twitch muscles like you either have it or you don't so like me trying to run a marathon it would be it would be very challenging for me to no amount of training would make it as easy for me as it is for someone who's slow twitch muscle. Yes. Right. Sure. sure, sure. You just d d someone who can do long distances versus someone who it's hard to do long distances. Yes. And like I could roll out of bed and jump 30 inches in the vert. Like I was always able to do that and I could yeah. still do that. And so I trained for a quarter to do it. I ran four, six in the 40. Uh -huh. I jumped 33 inches in the vert, 10, seven in the broad. And then I benched 225, 16 times. And, and that's like almost about average. How far from that was your? Was it from your average though? Like so, in when high were, school and college, I did a lot better. Okay, but yeah. it, but I mean, when you were like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna see how I can do in the NFL combine. Did you have a baseline? Like, how far is that from where you were when you had the idea to do this crazy thing? Not significant. I was seventy percent there. Wow. Yeah, but again, you just didn't get out of shape because I work out a lot yeah, and yeah. I pick a new goal every quarter. But also, again, it's like you, sometimes you have it or you don't. Like there's some, sure. and that just happens to be my skill set. And I was born a little bit built to do that stuff. And I've always been able to squat heavy weights. Like I, I could roll out of bed and squat like 380 or 400, like without too much training. But if you try to get me to run a marathon, I would, I could, I mean, I couldn't run one mile right now faster than seven minutes. You pick a fitness goal every quarter? Yeah, typically. Right now I had a kid. So like yeah. I'm a little wander. Right now I'm like just stay fit while working the least amount in the gym yeah but yeah i usually pick a quarter usually it's lately it's been like a bench or a squat goal the combine right now i'm slowly gearing up i want to do an ultra an okay. ultra marathon uh before that it was Not, have you done a marathon between there no okay. i've done what's the longest distance i've done a half iron man okay so i ran 15 or 18 miles sure. before in a, in a training run but the ultra seems easier actually than running a marathon fast do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. Because uh, an ultra marathon is like, are you alive at the end of it? Yeah. That's success versus like, uh, how fast can you do this Right. Thing? And that, and I actually think running 50 miles at a slow pace will be easier than running marathon when you're trying, when you're redlining. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't done, I haven't well, done. Neither I have know. I. So yeah. we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> no, as a theory, it makes sense. It makes sense to me. Like, and and I the competition the the competition is less in the sense that everyone in the ultra marathon I would make up is just trying to not die, versus the marathon which is like you're racing against each you other. You don't pick goals. I don't. I don't pick any fitness goals. So do I, you have like a do you have programming? Like what do you how do you know you're, what you're going to do just, next week? I just do the same thing like every week. I just run. I just run every day. 
uh, or swim. Sometimes I sometimes I break it up with swimming or biking. But it, for me, it's it's more. I just I just do that thing to get to even every day. So typically, the way that you gain muscle is you have to do progressive lifting. Yes. Meaning yeah. Yeah. More weight or more reps, less rest, whatever it is. You don't have any progressive. No, it's. I would say it's almost entirely uh, mental and emotional regulation, and the fact that it is <clears throat> a physical activity is a coincidence. That's funny. No, I like to have a. I like to have some type of target, like a benchmark, where I can like see some type of improvement. So it could be like stretching. It's like this quote. I'm gonna try and do the, the splits. Yeah. Like let's just see what I could. I like improving. There's a there was a joke on Eastbound and Down where someone asked if he's like training for a marathon or something, and he goes, "I'm trying not to be the best at exercising." No, he's like, "I play real sports. I'm not yeah. trying to be the best at exercising." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I sometimes think about that. Like I'm not. I'm not trying to win at my hobbies. Like I like doing my hobbies. Yeah, I, I understand that. I'm like that with reading. So when I read, I tell people I don't read to learn. Huh? I read because this I is like just reading. an interesting topic. Yes. And so I you like I was looking at your bookstore. You there was like the self help section. I was like, oh, between the age of twenty and twenty eight, I read all of these. Yeah. And then now I haven't read any of those in years, and it's just strictly what I find interesting. So with reading, it's strictly interesting. Learning sometimes happens. Well, it yes. always happens, but that's not the main point. Yes. But well, yeah, with working out, I, I tell I tell people. Uh, well, actually, Scott Galloway was on your pod. He said, uh, "I want to." He said something that was amazing. Okay. Actually, do you remember what he said? No, why he no, exercises. We'll he says, um, "I want to be able to um, uh, kill and eat everyone in the room or outrun them." <laughs> and I was like, "That's great. That's sure. like my so like yeah. I kind of work out that way." But I also just say, "I want to look awesome, feel awesome, and live to be old." Yes. And feel great while I'm old. And that's basically it. Yeah. I think uh, I see this with reading where people are like into speed reading or they tell me they listen to audiobooks on like eight speed or whatever. That's you know? bullshit. And I go, why? Like I enjoy doing it. I don't try to rush through it. In fact, like. Well, I think speed reading is nonsense, right? Well, of course. I think it's a scam. But the point, there are people who are trying to do it faster, right? Like even if speed reading does not exist, there are, there are people who are trying to read faster. Meanwhile, there's like slow eating, you know, like p actually pleasurable activities. People try to make take up more time, not less time. Yeah. W with like I've been w for building companies, I've been trying to build companies slower now, like build like projects, like businesses build slower. Yeah. And I because what's the point? What are you I, I mean, what are you rushing towards it not being over? It, well, the I, next thing? I used to rush towards things and I'm happy yeah. I did. No, I'm saying that to me, the question is like, why, why are you trying sure. to get this over as quickly as possible? Like right. I thought you enjoyed doing it, you yes. know, and obviously running, if you're not doing it quickly, you're not really running. Right. And so you're not getting the, any of the, like, I also walk, but the, the point is there are some things you, you walk. I don't know. I don't, do you think you get 10,000 easily? Easily. Really? Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously not the last, uh, eight days. Yeah. Or whatever. But, um, no, I'm, I'm always walking, uh, and I, I usually do my phone calls walking. I do everything walking, but uh, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to get it over with. I I like doing it. Like like lately, I've been running in the morning, so I run. I watch the sun come up while I'm running. Then I come home, and then I sort of go. I I'm trying to get to an emotional and uh, like uh, hormonal place where I'm chill. And if I don't, I can feel it. Like I well, because you're not a chill it. person. Oh yeah. No, you are a kinetic. You have kinetic energy. Like I when I hung out with you a few years ago, like you do what I do as well. You, your legs are bouncing. Uh huh. Like you're you 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 need to move. I don't yeah. think you're a chill person. I think you're maybe no. you're chiller. No, no, I was joking. I'm, I'm definitely not. A you're chill not person. chill though. Yeah. You're not no, a chill I'm not. Person. No, not at all. I think I'm an intense person, and that is a. I would rather get that energy out there than in other places. No, and I feel that usually when I think about working out. It's just like, uh, you know, like when your dog, like you're like, he needs to go for a run. Like yes. he's insane. Uh -huh. That's how I kind of, I feel about it. I'm like, I'm going insane. I got to get out. I got to move. I got to tire myself out. Yeah, of course. No. And so, and I know when I'm, when I'm, uh, writing, I'm usually generating, uh, a certain amount of frustration, right? Because it's not, you're not anywhere close to finishing and you're, you're it basically when you're doing, when you're in the midst of a creative thing, there's some parts of it that are pleasurable, but for a good chunk of it, what you're doing is like just inventing problems for yourself, right? Because you're like, you're working, you're just cre going into areas that you then have to figure out and solve for, right? Like I'm 
well, maybe I'll say this or maybe I'll say this. And then I, I still have to figure out how that's going to go. And it'll be months from now until that's like perfect. So I'm, I'm just creating a bunch of open-ended frustration uh, effectively, right? So if I don't have outlets to work out that frustration, other things are going to get the brunt of that frustration. So that's what the practice is for me. Do you, um, with your family and your, you have kids and everything, do you acquire a lot of things like physical things? Yeah. Uh, like, are you like a conscientious consumer where you like try not to like buy a lot of crap? I try to get rid of crap, but I don't, I'm not super conscious about not acquiring crap. I've been, but I'm also not conscious about acquiring crap. Well, you said sense. something about um, you're doing this project and that just creates more pro problems for yes. you. Lately, I've been noticing I'm like becoming gun, like so into not buying things uh -huh. that like give clutter in my life sure because it wears me down so much so i've got a f i i've had like nice cars and i'm like yeah. this fucking sucks like this sucks like these yeah. tires are 2500 i don't even want to drive this thing it breaks or yeah, you go to turn it on the battery's dead There's yeah just like stop oh oh you have to have special insurance for that you don't realize how many problems you no and then i need to, I have, and then I have an assistant to help me manage a lot of this stuff. Uh -huh. And then I got to go buy a bigger house to store this stuff. Yeah. And then I've got to pay money for 1-800-GOT-JUNK to come and throw away the stuff that held the stuff. Yeah. Then I've got to buy some more stuff to store the stuff. Yeah. I'm like, that's been my thing lately in 24 is I can't stand stuff. I'm trying to get rid of everything and I don't want anything. Have, there's a George Carlin joke about how to you it's stuff to other people with shit. And then realizing also like, uh, as soon as you're not there, what it is to other people, how quickly it, it becomes obviously trash. Like if you're going through someone else's house or you are moving or whatever, you you, su you have a different, you suddenly see all right. the stuff you've acquired from a different it's lens. It's the worst. Immediately able to get rid of it. Whereas uh, the, I think one of the hard parts about having kids is you, so much stuff acquires a certain emotional significance to you, even though it is the same. Garbage. And I'm angry at myself because I, I'm like, I need this stuff. Yeah. You know, but, and then, so what I've been trying to live by is, you know, the phrase reduce, reuse, recycle, Uh huh. get rid of the recycle part. That's bullshit. Yeah. You, you know, like recycling is nonsense. Like it, yeah. it gets all thrown away. Like, uh, yes. Like, Metal is easy to recycle. Everything else is not. Yeah. But like the, you know, the blue bin. Yeah. That's bullshit. Like you can't just throw like, cardboard with ketchup on it a green glass and a soda can into the same thing and it magically gets turned into a thing the only or yeah we think all plastics are the same but every plastic melts at a different temperature gets turned it, you can't just not all plastics uh melt yeah down and it doesn't and like yes, of course. and now uh china used to buy a lot of recycling they yeah. don't really do that anymore so yeah. like i went and talked to for some projects we had to do i had to interview like people who owned waste management companies i'm like dude this all gets thrown away. Yeah, yeah. This, it, it all goes to the garbage. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, let's just get rid of the recycling. I'm just going to reduce, reuse. That's it. Reduce, reuse. That's it. Sure. It just not acquire stuff. Yes. And uh, anyway, it's been bothering me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, like I was, I went through my garage the other day and I looked at it. And I was like, this garage is a graveyard. It's a graveyard of kids I don't have anymore. Right. Like in the sense that, okay, here's like the single stroller, then the double stroller, then the running stroller that we use, but then I broke. So then I got another one. And it's just all this stuff from eras of my kids. And my kids aren't even that old, right? My oldest is seven, but already at seven, you have all these different phases that they've been through and are not in anymore. And the garage is just um, all these different things are like little gravestones of a thing I won't do anymore. And so so there's part of you that just goes clear it out. And then there's the other part of you that goes, oh, I loved that. And then you don't want to get rid of it. And then you just keep it. And like my parents now just may, just like unsolicited. It's like, oh, here's another package of plastic from I, my childhood. I can't stand it. And then and that what they're basically saying is like, here, you throw this away because well, they won't do it. You have this book called Perpetual Seller, right? Perennial seller. Per, yes. Sorry, per, perennial seller. Uh -huh. And you, I saw you give this great presentation on, um, I think you mentioned like Zildjian, Zildjian symbols. Yes. How do you say it? Yeah, Zildjian, I think. And uh, like brands that last 100 plus years and, and, and classic books that last and they yeah. actually sell more. And, and I think that you're on track to doing that. And so you might be familiar with this, but have you heard of the buy it for life? Um, there's a buy it for, for life movement. You know what okay. that is? Yeah. So it's a big subreddit and there's groups on Facebook for it. But it's this idea, and I used to do this all the time, where I'm like, well, I don't need the $1,000 thing. I'll just buy 
the fifty dollar thing. Yeah. But the fifty dollar thing you end up throwing away and you buy much more of that stuff. Yeah. And so what I've been really like gung ho about is the buy it for life movement. And so you buy things that can last decades. So for example, or hopefully lifetime. Yeah. So for example, we're buying a crib right now for my kid. Yeah. I want to get like I've been suckered into this Amish thing, which <laughs> I don't even know if it's truly Amish, yeah. but the concept of like people did this by hand and like there's this one crib that it's a normal crib and then it turns into a toddler's bed yeah. and then you get this insert and it turns into a full size bed. So ideally they can have it from age zero to 18 or whatever. And then they say, and then their kid can actually use the same thing. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to buy is things that can last a lifetime or more. Interesting. Yes. My parents did send me like my wooden crib, my wooden high chair from when I was a kid, but I would never put my kid in it. It's like a death trap, right? Like, so the problem is some of the stuff, it was designed to last, but it was designed around assumptions that haven't held up. Sure. But I, I do, speaking of kids, there's one, I think I put it in the talk sometimes. There's like, I saw this picture of like an L.L. Bean jacket. It's like an L.L. Bean kids jacket. And it has uh, like, you know, the, the spot where you write your kid's name so they don't lose it at school. But then uh, underneath it, it has another line and another line and another line. And the idea is like, you should be writing multiple kids' names I love in this that. jacket. And Patagonia, if you go to Patagonia's website, they have a used section, yeah, like awesome. where they want, they're encouraging people to resell their products, which ostensibly deprives them of revenue from the new stuff, right? The planned obsolescence is, is a capitalistic assumption built into most brands. And here though, the marketing of it is, is, is I think important. They're saying like, first off, we actually do care about the environment. We care about the environment more than us making more money. But they're also saying like our stuff has resale value because it's not garbage yeah and i'm like a big fan of all that stuff right now yeah <laughs> like the whole movement yeah uh i think that's right i mean i have a pair of red wing boots that i'm on my fourth sole me for. too i need to i i gonna i was gonna bring them into the office i found there's a little boot store like a shoe repair thing across the street that's been in business since like the 40s and i was gonna bring them there and have them send them in and they're they turn into like a new pair it's crazy. It's awesome. And I remember I remember when I bought them. And they look them in, prettier. They look cooler. Yes, of course. Well, I remember when I bought them, they were $300. And that was expensive. I thought that was insane. I mean, I've since bought like sneakers that cost that much money that, you know, are already falling apart. Meanwhile, yeah, I'm almost 15 years into these shoes. And so that's like they're amazing. What I've been focused on lately is yeah. things that last forever. I think that's right. Uh the pro yeah, I think our generation you know, if you stay in the same house forever, if you don't move a lot, you know, uh, there were there were assumptions that I think made it that society shifted. It made it easier and it made it a lot more sense to, like, get your stuff from Ikea than to get, like, a really good dresser because you were never going to move that. You weren't you weren't going to be driving that dresser across the country sure. or moving it multiple times. To- like, you know, like if if a couple is getting married at 20 years old and then staying together forever, it makes more sense to like invest in stuff that lasts. If if everything, the problem is so many other parts of our lives have become ephemeral. So it becomes harder to like invest in stuff. Do you think you'll live in your current home forever or own it forever? Uh, I think so. I mean, uh, I haven't found anything that I like better and yeah. I, I've looked, you know, yeah, I think so. I mean, but I'm different. I, I bought like, not I'm different, like I'm special, but like we, we bought like a ranch. You're, you're not supposed, it's not like a, uh, a house you sell and then buy a bigger house than a bigger I'm house or something. We're going to s- probably sell our house and I'm going to rent until I find the dream home that I want. And I'm really? going to buy a home that I intend to live in for 50 years. But how do you know what that place is? Well, I don't. That's why I'm going to rent. I'm not oh, going to rush. Yeah. I'm going to. I'm just going to rent a place. You know, the world. You know, our friend Rami. He's like all going home about renting, and I. Yeah. I tend to agree with him. Of like, I'm just going to rent until I know what it is I really want for a long period of time. When I interviewed Tim, he sat right there. He's. He said he. He loves this expression, uh, "rich enough to rent." He rents too. Well, he. No, his point is that there are things that. Like it, it, it's in many cases more efficient to buy something, right? Not in all cases, and maybe home ownership it's not true. But the point is, we go like uh, they do the math, and you go like, oh, it's more efficient if I buy it, right? Or I could save some money over the long term if you buy it. But and he's saying, what if you can get to a place financially where you don't care? Where you don't care? You're just doing the thing that is easier and less of an imposition for you. Yeah. So I'm now renting, starting in a few weeks, a furnished home. Yeah. And I'm not going to own any. I, I'm I'm bringing my clothes. 
Wow. Yeah, that's it. And I'm getting rid of everything. I don't want any of the stuff. Okay, you mentioned Scott Galloway earlier. I, I, I messaged you when I saw the clip, but I was very struck by you had him on My First Million and you guys were talking about money. And dude, that he, clip he, went viral and I got made fun of so much in the comments that I think they missed the point. Well, I want to hear the point because I thought it was it, I've known you a while and I thought it was very vulnerable and real, if not a rather unrelatable for probably 99.9% .9 of the population. But basically he was asking you, at, you'd sold your first company and how much you'd made. And it seemed like you were ashamed to say that you made only twenty million dollars, I wasn't ashamed. So let's let's recreate the clip. So Scott Galloway, um, I'm I'm a huge fan of Scott's. Yeah, yeah he's great. Wildly successful. Yeah. On the podcast, somehow, well, it always comes this way because it's called My First Million. We talked about money. Yeah. And he was like, basically, I'm. He said, I'm. He's worth over nine figures. So he's like, I have a hundred million plus liquid. Yeah. And I was like, that's wild. How much you spend per month? And he's like, sometimes four hundred grand a month. And I was like, that's intense. That's yeah, insane. Yeah. That's that's wild. That's stressful. And then he goes, all right, I'm sitting here telling you everything. You tell me. What about you? I didn't tell him my net worth, but basically I had a company that I sold three years ago. And I walked away with around $20 million. Okay. Um, and he asked me that, and I kind of choked up at first. And then I said, I said the number. The clip has been seen millions and millions of times. And everyone thought that I was ashamed. I don't know if I was ashamed. Maybe, so I guess the thing about making money and earning money is there's like crazy amounts of levels. Yeah. So someone may have saw my clip and they're like, no way I'll ever have 20. But then yeah. I'm with a guy who's got 100. Uh -huh. And then I've got friends that have billions. And so maybe there was a little bit of like, well, I'm I'm on a good track. Like, yeah. you know, it's working out. Not necessarily like I'm done. Yeah. Because it, it certainly doesn't feel that way. But it's like, oh, I'm on the right track. But also like, he put me on the spot and like I had yeah. to like No, you're talking real numbers and in, instead of hypotheticals. So there's something I think inherently vulnerable about that. And then there I could see someone being ashamed for the complete opposite reason also. Like they're just self conscious and they think money isn't something that you should talk about, right? Like I could see someone being embarrassed for that reason also. But yeah, it it, it I took from your body language and your answer that you didn't feel like that was it's not that you didn't feel like it was a lot, like you need more, but you felt like comparatively that wasn't a big success. Well, I do feel that way. Yeah. Um, I don't think I'm ashamed of that though, but okay. I do feel that way where I feel like that is a nice, that's a, that's a nice chapter in my journey. And I, and, and there's more chat. I have, I'm going to have more chapters and it's not necessarily the money. It's just that we were talking about fitness yeah. and we were talking about running. I said, I like goals. It's fun. It's fun. It, I get a rush. It's, it's exciting for me to see progress in my life. And it's nice. It's nice having a goal to do more. Additionally, my podcast, it's a lot about money. And I have like crazy successful people on yeah. who are both successful in the traditional sense, but also like they're happy. I admire them, whatever you've been on. I admire you. All these people I admire. And a lot of people look up to me and they'll ask me questions or ask me for a photo. And I'm like, what the fuck? These guys are yeah. way cooler. Like yeah. they're the ones I like. And sure. so I get a little self-conscious about being considered a guru and yeah. things like that, where it's like, no, I need to be, I need to do what I'm talking about. I, not someone who talks about it. Do you think, uh, there was part of you that wanted much, much more, and that's why it doesn't feel like uh, no. a lot to you? No. So originally, I started my company, I think the first real business that I started, or the second one, I started when I was 24. My goal, I talked to a bunch of rich people, and they told me, I, the richest guy I talked to, he at the time was spending 100 grand a month or 80 grand a month. And on I the was, business or like no, on personal, his personal life okay. and i was like that's so much money yeah, and at the and at the time it's a it's a it's yeah. insane. at the time i was spending three thousand a month in san francisco i was spending nothing i lived for very cheap and i was basically like i was pretty much almost, almost poor and he just said that number and i was like okay well what sum do i need to have that i could spend that if i wanted to and never run mm -hmm. out of money for the rest of my life and I came up with that number roughly $20 million. And so I said, by 30, I want to post-tax post, post tax have that invested into uh, index funds and bonds, like liquid money, not yeah. net worth, liquid money. Maybe I'll have other stuff, but that's what I want. 
And so I did it by 31. I sold the company when I was 31. And so I worked backwards. And so my company now is worth probably significantly more. Some of my competitors who I'm great friends with now, they're probably worth two to two fifty. Okay. And so do I regret selling? Not a chance. I had a goal. I'm happy I hit the goal and I don't regret it. Yeah. But I definitely want more. Not necessarily for the lifestyle, but partially because I'm just like I didn't grow up with a lot and I'm like always afraid of running out. Yeah. Uh even though I don't want to acquire nice things, I'm just kind I'm just crazy afraid. I think it's just like it's a personality defect, but also because like, it's like bench pressing. Like I did 295. Let's see if I can get 300 in two or three weeks. Like, wouldn't that be exciting? Yeah. The, the paradox of whatever the attitude that makes someone good at growing and achieving, right? The ability to look back and see what you could have done better and to primarily focus on what, how you could have done more or better. Uh, that's obviously a propulsive force. Yeah, and there's downsides. Yeah, the downside is that it makes it hard to enjoy or appreciate because yeah. you're you're doing that even when you have so surpassed whatever the mark was. Like I wanted to write one book. I thought if I I could write one book, that would be success. That would make you an author. I would look at it. It would be, you know, and then I did that at 25 and then I somehow did it like literally every year since then. <laughs> and uh, well past whatever the economic need to do that thing. So that's not what's driving me. Uh, I I felt like each time I'd said everything that I needed to say, but then, yeah, there's just this part of you that just and keeps you going are, and going. And you are who I look up to you because you're like, you're a wise man. Like you're a wise person. Like you've, like I I read all of your old blog posts, the huh. stuff that used to be on Thought Catalog. Like I've read oh, all, everything. Okay. I watched the Daily Stoic. I consume all your. I, mean, I text you all the time. Yeah, I'm like, dude, did, yeah. this video was really good. I loved this video. My takeaway was it. Like I actually consume all your stuff. I admire you. Oh, thank you. Um, but and even you are like, it'd be nice to be better. It'd be nice to be more, more, yeah. more. And so I accept that that's like a natural part of just like, I think everyone, particularly people who are self starters, of which I, I self identify as. Uh, so I just think it's just like, it comes with the territory. Like for example, last night, yeah. I spent an hour cleaning this thing and putting it on Facebook Marketplace and I sold it for $400. A, I loved it. Like it felt awesome. Like to get what that- What was it? A cabinet, okay. like, like a workbench. Cause you're, cause you're moving? Well, I'm downsizing, yeah. yeah, and I'm gonna move. But like I get, or like I, I had an old Xbox that I didn't even know I had. I got a hundred bucks for it. <laughs> Someone's coming tonight. And like, I get joy out of that. Like yeah. that A, a brings me, uh, uh, joy but b there is like a fear of like losing and so yes. i'm like oh I, I, I can't just throw this away i need this i can't have waste and i think that that it just comes from i don't know what it comes from but it's the same personality type or it's the same personality trait of like this is the numbers that the business did this month we got to increase that by 20 percent next month here's how yeah there is this kind of i don't want to trauma sounds like a strong word but i was listening no to, i think it's I, trauma i was listening to ramit's podcast a couple of months ago and he was talking to this couple uh that was very cheap and they were trying to trace back like why they became cheap. And the guy sort of traces it back to his grandmother who like survived the depression. And so whenever he would visit as a kid, you know, and she would hear that he like saved up his money and bought this toy or bought a piece of candy. She would like, shouldn't do that. You never know where it's going to come, you know, when you're going to lose it, you know, or whatever. And he was talking about how that's sort of this curse that he and his wife have like born their whole life. And then... Rabit goes, and how would you feel like if your daughter was that way? And you would think that he would go like, well, the whole point of being successful would be to like break this generational trauma and to free my daughter from this sort of sense of scarcity about money and finance. And then immediately the guy's like, well, you know, it's been so like he's immediately going like, he's but like it served me it. so well, I have to like pass it on. And so he couldn't see that like his grandmother had like – effectively abused him uh, or his parents and then his parents had abused him and now he was abusing his daughter even though they had millions of dollars you know they were like sweating over like you know who picks up the tab at dinner or something or whether they can afford to like go on this small and Ramit vacation. criticizes me for this all the time of course no and, and I do think that one one of the again this is a first world problem compared to so many other problems but like whatever was a large amount of money to your parents becomes like a baseline for you, right? And so one of the tricky things that comes along with succeeding financially or even just 
existing in a new world where things, uh, the market is different and money is worth different amounts is to be able to, to look objectively at amounts and see money as it is, not as whatever lens your parents made you think about it, especially when you've like so blown past that. And, and I think you see that when, when you ask someone like, what's an amount of money that you sweat? You know, and someone will be like, oh, you know, I, w- I wouldn't want my wife to spend more than what's $200. Uh, it ch- I think I don't have a number generally. It's like different things, which right. is kind of the problem. Like you should be able to get to a place where like you don't think about anything below this. Yeah, number. it's like you could like you could be like, what's your hourly rate? And is it worth that hourly rate for me? If I see like clothing if i see like a disposable good that's like above a thousand i'm like do i really want that like when i sit down to eat i don't like think about how much this stuff is on the menu I don't do that but but then like all if i find out like i don't like i i just sometimes i i just stress i go like did they overcharge me on this thing like like for some other bill for like the same amount of money do you know I'm, what i mean well, i'm paranoid about being taken advantage of and that's one of the reasons why i got nervous when scott asked me that Really? Um, yeah, I'm paranoid about being taken advantage of. So I feel you th- like I get taken advantage of. So you thought he would say like, oh, you should have sold the company for a lot more money? No, about just vultures asking for stuff. Uh, oh, oh, you thought by giving the number you were making yourself vulnerable to be taken yeah, advantage Yeah, like of. I'm very nervous about that. Um, yeah, I get quite nervous about that. And I'm like, like, for example, I have a ranch as well. And if like I've got like, let's say I have a Tesla at the ranch when yeah. I have a vendor coming over to fix my driveway. Like I'm like, I gotta hide. I've gotta hide the car, you know. Really? I'm, yeah, I'm like quite nervous about that. Um, There's a story about Epictetus. He's at his house one day, and uh, he's like in another room, and he hears like rustling, and he comes in, and this slave uh, uh, who sort of clawed his way up from nothing. That's what Epictetus has. This like he has this shrine in his house, and he sees a a man is stealing a lamp from the the silver lamp from his shrine to the gods and running out. And Epictetus is like distraught at first. And then he goes, you know what? No, I'm being foolish. He says, you can only lose what you have. And he says, tomorrow I will go and buy an earthenware lamp. And he buys a cheaper lamp. He's like, I shouldn't have anything that I'm afraid of being stolen. Um, And I think about that sometimes. Like the thing, like I'm purchasing the nice thing, but I'm also purchasing the worry or the stress or the vulnerability to other people. What I phrase, what what I'm really trying to do is... I own my things. They don't own me. Yes. Because I remember like being a kid and like we dented the car playing yeah. hockey. Yeah. My dad flipped. Yes. And I'm like, I'm, I don't ever want to be like that. You yeah. know, I won't flip. I own sure. it. And so I really work hard to, to do that. Have you heard, have you read the book, um, the, uh, the courage to be disliked? Uh huh. So it's like a set in Japan. It's supposed to, I think it's a nonfiction book, uh, yeah. but it's about, uh, is it Arthur? Is it a uh, can't? Kant? Kant. Kant. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he's one of the big four, like yeah. big psychologists, whatever. And the takeaway from that book was basically like you you choose to be anxious a little bit. Yes. And you self-identify as an anxious person. Therefore, you will continue to be anxious. And when, we t- when people talk about this stuff, with, well, at least when I talk to Ramit about this, he's like, dude, you're being a tightwad because you are self-identifying as a tightwad. And you're going to continue perpetuating that particularly with your children, yeah. with your wife, with the rest of your family, because you have self-identified that. And it's and it's not particularly easy to not self-identify that. that requires... what his, his point is actually the reason it's so hard to not be cheap is that most people who are cheap think it is a virtue and not a vice. Correct. He's like, you are taking pride in this stupid thing. Yes. And he's, I, I believe him to be right. I yeah. believe he's right. But that is a very, like, you know, that's a hard thing to overcome. But I believe that that mentality is correct. No, the, the ability to adjust what that amount of money is relative to your net worth is, is, is work, right? So, you know, when you were young and struggling to, to save up $1,000 to put it in the stock market or, or whatever, that's you were so proud of that and you should have been proud of it. And then as you get older, that, that number has to be 10000 And then if you get to, to 100000 then you hear about, you know, I don't know, some billionaire makes a $100 million bet on something. Like that seems like a lot of money and it is to you, but to them, it's uh, relative to their net worth, a, a reasonable amount of money with the certainty or the, 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 the certainty they have about the bet or the potential upside they have about the bet. And so to be able to adjust uh, as you grow, what is reasonable or unreasonable is really important. Otherwise you are, it's like, it's like you were an animal in one size cage 
and now you're in a bigger cage, but you're only pacing like this right. little outer bound and you don't understand that you have a lot more space or freedom. Uh, and, and that, that seems, it seems foolish to be artificially constrained. Well, what I told my wife yesterday, I was like, my personal philosophy and my personal operating system is not scaling with yes some of my success or some of sure. the demands that I have of people have of me or whatever. And that's, that's actually a, a pretty significant failure that needs to be addressed. Well, and you learn it we, really, you learn a lot of these lessons as a business before you learn them personally. So like as a business, you go, well, I could do all this myself, but I need uh, businesses hire people. So I'm going to hire someone. And then you understand, oh, when I hire people, it helps me make more money or it helps me scale what I'm doing. Um, or if I don't hire someone, all that money just goes to the government or whatever, right? You 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 sort of, you're able because the business is, is not you. The business is this external thing. You go, hey, we need office space or we I need this tool or what you know you, you're able to see There's a much clearer roi yes and then in your personal life you struggle to make some of those very same uh judgments even though the same thing applies I call it, uh, what's that phrase um a penny poor pound what, what is it uh, oh, a penny a pe wise a, pound foolish yeah that's exactly what it is do you do you do you and your wife track your spending and income like do you have like a meeting once a month or once a quarter or once a year no so do you just make decisions on like, oh, let's just do this? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Um, how do you, how does that make you feel? Do you think that's the right think, thing or not? Uh, I think some, in some ways it's the right way. In some ways it's not. I think uh, one, one attitude I have, maybe you disagree with this, but I go like. It, I'm not saying my way is the right no, way. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying like, I try not to think that much about money. Right. To me, that's like, like, I think if you, if you are thinking about money all the time, you're not rich. Yeah, I agree. You know, and so I try, I, I, I try to be efficient. I try to be smart. I try not to be reckless, but I also try not to, like, uh, I don't know, obsess over everything in a spreadsheet or like some sort of interface with a graph. Like I, I just try to, I try to make good decisions. I try to set up systems that automate most of what I should be doing. Uh, I try to have just generally good habits, tastes, you know, practices. And then uh, I try not to obsess that much about optimizing. I'd let, I'd rather focus on optimizing the things that I get a lot of meaning out of, which would be like my work, let's say, as opposed to, you know, my my final financial picture. What I do is I just look at what my like the fifth of the month. I'm like, all right, what was my income last year? Because it's I've got a, a, a variety of sources. And yeah. I'm like, well, how do we do whatever? And then I say. Um, like we'll we'll like say like all right what are, what do we want to be in five or ten years like let's try to average roughly this per month and spend and I don't actually care entirely where the money goes I'm just yep. saying like ballpark this is what like hey we we're way under this month if like just so you know like yeah if you want like you don't have to you know you could splurge a do little. Do you think bit. a month is too small of a unit of measurement for what? Is no, a much I, larger, bigger picture. I think it's annual. I, okay. I, I think of it in annual, but oh. like I'll just like like I don't have categories set up on my budget. I'm just like our spend. We spent this much money this month. Uh, I'm just like, all right, that's interesting. That's cool. I'm like, wait, what was this two thousand dollar purchase here? I'm like, yeah. oh shit, we forgot to cancel this thing. Yes. So you, that's usually why I look at it. I'm like, yeah. oh, I forgot to do this thing or um, whatever. Like just admin shit like that. But it's just like, generally, this is how much I know we're going to spend. If we go over, that's no big deal. If we are way under, I'll be like, hey, you know, like, we're not spending nearly enough that we said we wanted to spend. Yeah. Do you want any, like, services? Like, sure. is there, like, would you would the cleaning lady coming every two days make you happy? Like, yeah. what, what would make you happy? Sure. And so I try to be, like, conscientious of, like, what makes me happy and, like, go spend more on that. Yeah, I think I think one of the things I've found with a business that's been helpful is like, okay, you understand there's certain like just costs associated with the business and you pay them. There's taxes associated with the business, you pay them. You or other people make mistakes in the business and you just have to pay that, right? There's breakage, stuff gets stolen, you know, there's there's just like there's just things that you eat. Yeah. You know? But in your personal life, it, I think because it's a business, you go, that's business. I don't control that. But then in your personal life, people think think they have much more control over it than they do. And so each one of those things that they have to eat goes down much more painfully. Whereas if you can treat your life a little bit more like a business, you uh, you won't sweat every one of those things. Like Seneca says, you, you pay the taxes of life gladly. 
uh, I don't think he meant just like the taxes you pay the government. I think he just meant like there's a cost associated with all the things in life. But I think we have this fantasy of control or of getting it perfect. And that makes us anxious and stressed out about a bunch of things that if you just sort of shrugged your shoulders to, not only would you be happier, in the end, your final like sort of picture would probably be exactly the same as it was if you were sweating it. At Have you heard of the, um, the company Nerd Wallet? Yeah. So it's like a credit card uh, yeah. review website. I uh, was buddies with the founder, Tim, and, and Jake, the two guys that started it. I think it's publicly traded now at like a one and a half billion dollar valuation. It's like yeah. a huge, great company, whatever. I'm He um, advised the hustle when I first started. He oh. gave me a lot of advice and uh, he was a small investor. And I remember when our business hit a hundred grand per month in expenses. I think we were making one hundred fifty thousand in revenue or something like that. Yeah. And I went to him. I go, Tim, I'm so stressed. Like, look at my spreadsheet. Like, uh, we're spending a hundred grand a month. Sometimes yeah. I don't even know like what we're spending on. And he's like, Yeah, but you made one hundred and fifty. He's like, Let's try to like, what can we do to make you spend two hundred and yeah. grand? And then now you'll make three hundred. And like, yes. And I was like, Wait, what? Doesn't yeah. that like stress you out? He goes. No, dude, it's just a number on a spreadsheet, and I'm an investor. He's like, as CEO, like I'm just investing capital into things that can turn to more. So, like, yes. if I have a machine that turns one dollar into a dollar fifty, I want to spend all of my money into that machine. Yes. And he had that talk with me. You know, I was like 25, trying to figure this out, and I like my mind was blown. I was like, you're right. This it's just with with a business, it's way easier. You know, it's just like it's, yes. it's just there's an input, and then you have to build a machine that has the output that's higher than the input, and that's actually kind of easy to do or rather it's simple to do yes and but it's kind of a bedrock assumption that you either get and that allows you to make things that grow and scale or that so challenges your sort of uh scarcity mindset or like whole like, you know desire to control things that you're you're just like not cut out for business or risk or yeah like, and that like totally changed my perspective I'm like spend more like spend more profitably rather yeah uh and that like was kind of a paradigm shifting moment that he had uh with me yeah it's like you you want to keep costs low but when your costs were lower you almost certainly were making less money as a business yeah so i was like spend more and, and because he's like no you're not spending you're investing invest more and i yeah. was like oh my god i think for a long time i had this impediment i just didn't want to hire anyone i just didn't want any employees how many you have six oh people? no way more it's probably like 15 uh maybe more i don't know but but I this is like for years. This is more when I had the marketing company, and and I think there was there was some good reasons for doing it. Like I I I I had this idea that if I had fixed costs, then I would have to take on clients to pay for those fisc, fixed costs that I didn't actually want. Well, to work yeah, with. that's because an agency business sucks. Yes, it does, <laughs> and and so it wasn't until I moved from an agency business, which Brass Check was for a long time, to making my own stuff, which is when you know, Brass Check started Daily Stoic and Daily Dad and the bookstore and other stuff, uh, that, that it was like, oh, wait, like um, I, I believe in all the stuff that I'm doing. And so the, the more I can grow, the more of that stuff I can do. I think Casey said that to me one time. Casey and I said, Does he have a team? Uh, he, he goes back and forth, I think like sometimes he does, it depends on what he's working on, but he said something like, he's like, uh, we don't uh, do projects to make money. We make money to do more projects. And the idea of like, oh, okay. Um, the, the more I can scale and the more I can, uh, bring in the more stuff I can make because it's not free to make stuff. Right? Yeah. He had this great thing about, um, uh, he did this video about being a creator or something like that. And I think he had a hundred million views before he turned AdSense on or whatever it's called on Google. He yeah. didn't monetize his videos. Yeah. And he was like, I thought I was punk rock. Yeah. He's like, I thought I was sick. I, like I was doing like, fuck the man. Like yeah. I don't need this money. And he was like, that was so stupid of me. Yes. Because I couldn't afford to make videos. I had to go do all these side gigs in order to make money to continue making this awesome daily vlog. And then he's like, it's also selfish. Like I have a family, like yeah. I should have been providing. Uh -huh. And uh, I completely agree with that mentality of people who don't monetize certain things too early. I'm like, well, is your product good? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, well, do you want to keep doing it? Yeah. Yeah. Then fucking charge money and make money so you can continue doing it. And, and also there's an arrogance in it, right? At some point in the future, you're going to want to keep doing stuff and people are going to be less interested 
in hearing from you and doing it right and at that point you're going to be desperate for someone to pay you or support you or fund you right yeah you always got to get it while it's hot so get it while it's hot like when people are paying you to make stuff or want to be a part of what you're doing the idea where you're like no no no, i want to keep it artificially small is i think silly i think it's silly i yeah i get i I mean i get that like it's for what i do like i talk about ancient philosophy so there's some people that think you know the idea of monetizing in any way or supporting it with ads or selling stuff that they just don't like it and i i get it i maybe if i was on the outside i would see that uh i would see it that way and maybe i see it that way with things that i like but um what what these people fail to realize is that it's not free it's not free to have this studio it's not free to have this pocket like when you start when you don't have an audience all the even the, the online tools are free right but when you start to have a large audience they pay you to access that audience like it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just to send like the daily stoic email who do you're you using ConvertKit? yeah convert kit doesn't doesn't charge hundreds of thousands of but it's dollars. a lot of money and you but, have to but it's a lot of money and then also i have to have someone edit them i have to have like there there's a lot of management that goes in if, if you put out if you're putting on a show for a million people every day which is what the daily stoic email is by itself uh you can't just do that from your bedroom and do it at a high level right it costs money and so so to be able to continue to do it and to be able to continue to accept new people into it you have to be able to make money and then uh what you find when you make money is that you can then go okay i'm going to keep a little of this to myself like you know pay for my house or send my kids to school or whatever and then I can reinvest the bulk of it into making more stuff that I give away for free. Is this going to turn into your business episode? Uh, What do you mean? uh, We want to do a business episode because I want to ask you. We can do a business episode. Let me ask you a question. Go for it. I don't know if your listeners will like this, so we could we could move past if you if you don't like this. Is the email newsletter potentially one of the greatest business models of all time? It's insane. Mine or all email newsletters? No, not all. If you set them up the right way. So at the hustle right now, I I don't I've sold it, so I don't have access. We, I think they have close to 4 million subscribers. Yes. Every day, 4 million Do you know how many people thing. it takes to write that? Three. Yeah, that's Three nuts. people. Yeah. Now, the reason I remember we had 30 or 40 employees when we sold yeah. because we had to monetize it. Then we had accounting and all this other stuff. Yes. But we, I don't remember the numbers, but I think, so let's say we were doing, we were doing well over a million a month. I think we're going to do 20 million the year we sold. But let's just say for round numbers, we were doing a million a month and we sent 26 emails per day. So that's like, what is that? So 25 divided by, so that's like, uh, is that what, uh, 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 40,000 per time we hit send. And we had three people writing yeah. it. And it's, it's a beautiful business model if you could nail it. The so fact I- that you, how, you have a lot of people, right? Uh, so da- daily stoic is about a million people a day. It's insane. Uh, obviously we don't send 25 emails a day and no, sorry. We did 25 a month. Oh, sorry. 26 a month. Yeah. So uh, every, uh, that's, that's every day, but Sunday, I think. Yeah. We, we send out every weekday and then there's, th- there's some other, but let's say we send it every single, we send it more or less every single day. Now, obviously it's less monetizable than, uh, email about business or, you know, well, like it's, it's a different, it's a different audience because it's so. Uh, it, it it encompasses everyone, which is great. Yeah. But then, from a business standpoint, that's less great than like these are these people. But that's who do twenty five million thing. impressions or whatever it is. It's crazy. It's a lot. And yeah. you, you basically, it's basically can be it potentially. It depends how hard you want to work. It'd be you and an editor. Yeah. It, it, yes. Yes. It's insane. It's a great business model. Uh, and I I think I recognized that when I when my agent came to me with the idea for a book. He said you should do this page a day book. And I was excited about it uh, for two reasons. One, um, I thought I could build something. That's the Daily co- Stoic? Yeah, the Daily Stoic. I thought, okay, I'll do the book, but then what comes after the book? I thought I would do it like I could just keep going. It would be something that would allow me to write every day on sort of meditations about this thing every day. But I also liked the idea that it it wouldn't be me in the, in the sense that I like the word I does not appear in Daily Stoic and in the emails, the word I does not appear. It's a, it's depersonalized. Yeah. I still write them all. Sometimes I, I, I like my editor will help me here or there. I can have someone sort of put together the bones of one for me. So it's scalable a little bit, but it, it's, I, I'm not, it's not like, what does Ryan have to say today? Let me tell you something about my life, right? Which 
with, with, as you write as yourself, it's it's much harder because it's it's personal, and then you have to. Th but but the idea of just having this thing that goes out every day, and and just the the sort of practice of doing it every day has been like amazing. And then yeah, it's a great it's a great business because you are you are creating you are you are talking to people every day, and then you get to say, while I have you. Let yeah. me tell you about this other thing, whether it's a sponsor or whether it's one of my books or whether it's something that like I just think is cool and should exist. And so versus I made your it. thought catalog days, you some were massive hits. Yes. Meant probably most were not massive hits. Yes. You know, that's like the rule of virality is like Are you writing to subscribers, uh, which is a base, or are you writing for an indetermined unknown audience that you hope will you will reach person by person uh and and you can just write better when you're writing to an audience that's because crazy you have a million people that's it's so nuts. much i mean it started i i what happened was i sent out an email to my email list then just like as me ryan and i think about nine or ten thousand people signed up this would have been the summer of 2016 and so now eight years later it's yeah it's about a million people is it all organic uh, like you mean, have we done ads for it? Uh, maybe here or there, like the occasional, like the gen thing where you're trying to convert people who are following you on another platform, but no, no. I was looking at our spending. Uh, I was looking at when I sold the company, I was looking at the numbers. I think we had spent $400,000 the month before we sold on growing the email list. Yeah. That's crazy. It's insane. That's crazy. This is, this is just word of mouth about something that really on its face is laughable that there is word of mouth for yeah it's insane but that's why it's awesome yeah it's great i love it it's the coolest thing and then obviously we started it with the, the daily dad which is like the second one um you write that one too i, I do both that's i do i just write a couple like i wrote one daily stoic email today i think i did a daily stoic and a daily dad email yesterday and i just yeah i just chip away at it so i i think we're right now we're like three months ahead for daily stock maybe two months ahead for daily Dad. so our newsletter was news so yes. there is no you, you don't get it you don't get ahead and so it was every night you got to do it it was really hard i did it for the first little while it was very hard so you made 20 million dollars what did that change for you uh i had less of a chip on my shoulder i felt like i could be a badass business operator and i still feel like i'm not quite there yet but i'm i had some um I had some, um, it, it made, it was like, just my parents would be like, shouldn't you be working today? And like when I'm home on Christmas break, cause I'm on my phone, I'm like, yeah, dog, I am working. <laughs> and like, just getting like a Wall Street Journal headline. It's like, see, I told you like, this is real. Did you so, feel like that's who you were trying to prove it to? Yeah, for sure. Your and parents? like every ex high school girlfriend, like, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, like people like try to tell you not to be like, you probably say this all the time, like don't have rage and, and like forgive people and i'm like i don't know it's kind of awesome fuel like to like improve yourself like the problem is it's hard to turn off yeah and so there's massive downside but i'm but i i would never deny someone that it's like it can be very productive but did it did it so it got you there but did you feel like when you did it that you had proved it because they because well maybe it's not didn't... binary it's not binary so it was like all right i'm on to something like i'm i'm getting closer to having a seat at the big boys table like i i I can, some people might take me a little bit more seriously now. Like I have some type of uh, evidence that I'm good at my job and I'm talented at the, the trade that I'm trying to master. Which uh, is business. Which is business. You know, I read Mastery, Robert Greene, it changed yeah. my life. And that's why I, you know, I purposely use those words of trade and mastery. I mean, yeah. that, his book, I remember reading that book, it blew my mind away um, or it blew my mind. Um, so did it, yeah. So it felt some type of like a sense of, all right, I'm decent at this gig. Um, and it does bring a massive amount of relief. Like, dude, being poor sucks. Like I, I paid myself. So I sold, I think in year four In year one, I paid myself 20 grand a year, year two, 20 grand a year, year three, I think it was 50. And then year four, I did pay myself a lot, like half a million. And, uh, cause the business was doing good. Yeah. And, um, but like for those first, like two or three years in San Francisco, I was on Obamacare because I was like under the limit of like I, I didn't have a lot of money and so that shit drags you down and so the people who say money doesn't make you happy it definitely makes you happier yes um and so there was a sense of like all right this whole thing that i've spent a lot a lot of time and effort on like it's given me some sense of security and like because like if gmail made a change i'm done 
Right. You know what I mean? Like, uh-huh. and so that felt, that was very high stress. So I did feel a significant amount of relief. The big boys table that you mentioned. I think that that's interesting. Cause I think a lot of people are like, I want to get into the club, right? Yeah. Whatever, or I want to be one of the guys. A lot, a lot of these are male metaphors, of course. Uh, cause that's unfortunately what business is sort of, there's there. It's actually indicative, right? Cause there's this kind of like, uh, immature dude energy to it right? yeah i like, think it's a lot of rooted, rooted in just like high school being yes, bullied and like, yes totally uh but there is this sense that you'll arrive at some point you'll get it at some point you'll be accepted at some point you'll have proved it at some point do you feel like that is real no 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 no. arriving is not real yeah maybe getting closer to that ever-changing destination is closer yeah. or is is reality but no arriving is not the reality i like I still have massive insecurity. I think the, the difference is, is that I understand that having the insecure feelings is very normal. So yeah. I used to, the hustle, it was a daily newsletter. We also hosted these huge events. So I don't know if you ever spoke to one, but we'd have people like you, or we would have like the founders of the largest companies, the startups like in the world. So I remember I was backstage one time and I was with Miguel, the found, the guy who started WeWork. And back then we thought yeah, WeWork. He was, worked at American Apparel for a while. Yeah. And I yeah. thought, and he's a great guy. Yeah. When I hung out with him, it yeah. sucks that he, it, it was weird. That's a weird, it was a really weird combo. But, and this is back then when yeah. WeWork, I actually it thought it was biggest, a fi- $50 yes. billion dollar company. Yeah. There was this woman who started Away, like the suitcase business, yeah. Casper Mattresses, Casey Neistat was there one time. And then like, there was like another billionaire there. And I remember they were complaining. One guy who had a multi billion dollar company, he was like, because what I would do is I would tell people, you talk at one, you got to be here at 11 for sound check. There's no sound check at a <laughs> conference. Like, I just wanted to hang out with them backstage. Uh-huh. So I would tell them, you got to arrive two hours early. And I, we would all be in this room about this size with couches. Yeah. And I wouldn't say shit. I would just listen. And I was yeah. like, dude, I get to hang out with all these ballers. This is awesome. And they all fucking complained. They what all did said, they complain about? One guy was like, um, and it wasn't bad complaining, but it was like, um, I got to fire this person that has worked, but he's, I've had to fire him for a year, but I'm afraid of the confrontation. Yeah. Or this other person was just in the New York times for this hundred million dollar raise. And they're like, I don't know if we're going to figure this out. Yeah. And it was just all a bunch of people complaining. And at that moment, it, it felt as though I had bi- bad eyesight and I was able to put eyeglasses on where it's like, Oh, it's, it's awesome that I can be insecure and good at my job and succeed. And that made me feel so good. I remember there was this one guy named Sam Yagen, Sam Yagen, started OkCupid, and then he was the CEO of Match. I think it's Match. It's a publicly traded company. He was, and then there was a P- Payall. Payall started a class pass. Okay. And they were, I remember they were both so nervous to speak. We had like 3,000 people there. Yeah. And I was like, you guys have 3,000 people at your company. Why are you nervous? And and they were just really nervous. And I was like, hey, you want some water? And I remember Sam kind of snapped at me. And I was like, dude, I'm here to help you. I'm going to calm you down. Yeah. We got this. We yeah. can do this. And I just remember feeling so relief, so much relief that these people who I admired so greatly yeah. were nervous to talk in front of people, were afraid of confrontation, were felt insecure. And I remember like, so that like that moment and then selling and realizing I'm no different. Yeah. All of that stuff. I was like, interesting. it's so awesome and relieving that I can have insecurities. I can have flaws and still succeed and hit my goals or whatever. Like insecurity won't, won't go away. So, yeah, like with writing, there's this sort of debate about like when can you call yourself a writer? When you become like when have you when do you, when have you earned the title, right? And I think early on, you know, you're either jealous or you're judgmental of people who like call themselves a writer, and they're obviously not, right? And then you you also don't want to be the person who like you obviously are it, but you're depriving yourself of it, right? But yeah, there's this sort of you, you you get some sense that like when you get the thing you'll be good you'll have been accepted you'll have proved it and it was never an external thing to begin with the need was fundamentally internal from the beginning some <clears throat> some insecurity some sense of not being enough your parents not grabbing you at the right moment at the right time and being like you're good. You, you're, you're whatever, secure. you know, the Mr. <laughs> Rogers thing, like you make the world better just by being you. And so you have some sense that you can get it if you just achieve X, Y, or Z, if you can just get the medal, the Grammy, you know, so the you, certain amount of bank account. And you, you have you a Grammy it. right here. I do have a Grammy. I don't, is that for you or someone else's? No, no. I, I was a producer on an album that won a Grammy. Wow. Okay. So you have a Grammy. Yes. You have sold a shit ton of books. Uh, you are probably more successful than a lot of the authors that like get 
that are like all over the place in terms of like yeah win sales. awards or yeah sort of industry darling right sure. and your buddies with like world class athletes as well as authors do you feel I don't know who you admire I admire Robert Green I know you know him well sure uh, maybe there's like five or ten others who you're like this person's the pinnacle Robert Car uh, Caro yeah. Uh, when when you are around them, are you like we aren't the same? Oh, that's a good question. You know, okay, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I I heard uh, you know Pete Holmes, the comedian. He was uh, he was talking to some other comedian, and she was saying like like, do you have uh, like an aspiration to be like be one of the greats? And he was like, I am one of the greats. And like when when I heard it the first time, I was like, that's like what you know, that's like arrogant or weird or lame or not true. And then he was like, I am one of the greats. He's like, I've had like a show on HBO. I've done multiple specials. And he's like, I'm proud of the work that I... like it sounded like it was coming from a very arrogant place. Like I think when you first hear it and as an artist, you're very judgmental because you're like, wait, are they allowed to say that about themselves? And I don't say that about myself. And then I realized because I know Pete, he's actually coming at it from a very humble place, which is like he was saying like great. A great is like someone who just gets to do comedy. You know what I mean? And that like he's done the things and whatever the like who is sold the most tick sold the most tickets, uh, you know, performed at the best venues, the highest rated this or that, that's all superfluous stuff well after, you know, any 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 point of necessity. And so I kind of think about it like that. Like so when I if I'm around like people who have done it, like I feel like I'm an equal in the sense that we're all, Hemingway said this, we're all uh, apprentices in a craft that has no master. Like we're all just doing the thing. Like they know what it's like to stare at a blank page and start at zero. And I know what it's Do you like. Get, is there a one person or a few people who you'd be self-conscious around? Yeah. I mean, I, I would be self-conscious around anyone whose work uh, I really like because I'm like, where, how do you do that? Like, where did, where did that come from? But the, so, so I feel equal in the sense that like, we're all doing the thing. And then I feel uh, not equal in the sense that I feel like they have fulfilled, uh, they, they have reached to a plane above that I, I think I'm either still aspiring to or that it's not on me to say whether I did or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think like the most intoxicating thing about hanging out, you know, I have a podcast, so I'm yeah. able to hang out with successful people. Success in the sometimes financial, sometimes like you've just achieved uh, happiness or whatever you've achieved what yeah. you wanted to achieve. You've carved a path and you've walked the path. The cool part about that is that you see that in actually many cases, you guys can be in the same stadium of like IQ and ability. Yes. The difference is, is that they chose this path and, and you, cho you chose this path and something or, that or at a certain point, choice goes out the window and it's about market and genre and luck and, is real and luck and, I always tell and people. timing and and also like it's too early to tell you know yeah. like it's just it's so really like i think about it, it's like you were talking about boys club like i just want to be in the league like how many nba players are there each you know at any one time i want to be one of those uh, I don't need to be the best. And one. by the way, luck is real. Like I don't I, like anyone who like all, like pull yourself a bootstrap. Like dude, like fucking luck is the thing. Like you work hard and you're lucky. Like it's all couple. But what I what I've done what I've learned hanging out with all these badasses badass people is that um, I've only met a few people where I just think um, your oven just burns hotter than me. Like there, there's just nothing I could ever do will amount to anything you will do. So like. This guy named Max, he started Grammarly. Yeah. I've hung out with him and I'm like, oh, you're just smarter than, like, you are just significantly, like, I just, your brain has more power. You can lift more weight than I can just yeah. rolling out of bed. Sure. That guy's faster than me. Yeah. But in general, like, to achieve, make a success, there's been so many times where I've hung out with people where I'm like, oh, no, we're in the same, we're in the same league. Uh, we're just, we, it's just up to me. Like, I don't want to play this game. We work game that raises lots of money and is high stress. So it's more so like I now have faith in my ability that I can kick my dent in the in the earth like pretty nicely. It's just like what game do I want to play? And so that that's actually quite relieving to to have that feeling. And I and I encourage people to like truly embrace that because I remember like reading you, Noah, and all these guys. Now you guys are my buddies, and I'm like, yeah, they're great. But like, just if a person, maybe if I like they're skilled and talented and all this stuff. 
but I bet if I dedicated 10 years, like I could be in that ballpark of like whatever craft, if we have, uh, you know, overlap of skill set or an interest, I'm like, I bet you I could be a decade away from that. Do you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. like having that like epiphany has like really yeah, changed it's like, life. Yeah, you meet like it, it depending on where you went to school, but you go like, oh, I'm not good enough to go to Harvard or something. And then when you actually like meet not just like one person that went to Harvard, but lots of people that have gone to Harvard or have, you know, you, you meet one person that sold a company for a lot of money and then you meet a lot of them. You go, oh yeah, this is, you, you start to get a sense that it's a, it's a much more representative pool than you think it yeah. is. And they aren't these kind of singular individuals that they're, that, that, that pretty much anyone could do it if, they they are willing to c- commit to uh, all these things and stay at it long enough to get yeah, lucky in like this I, way. I, I, t- in most cases, you you're like a decade away of like being almost as good as your heroes. Yeah, and of course there's freaks. Like yes. no amount of hard work will ever make me Usain Bolt. Yeah, but like I bet you I can go to the Olympics if I dedicated ten years and picked some sport like you know like and you game the system. Yeah. You're like uh-huh. you know what I'm saying like. Like you can, you could, if you pick the right game or pick a game that you think suits your taste and you give it 10 years, you're actually not that far from being uh, in the 1%. There's also this kind of demystifying thing where I'm not sure there's anything that like the richest person in the world has experienced uh, that like... Like, okay, obviously what the richest person in the world has experienced is vastly different than what like the poorest person in the world is experiences. And we're not talking about like, what is it, what is everything like day to day? But um, there is very little that a billionaire has experienced that I have not also experienced being relatively, uh, having gone just a few steps up the economic ladder. Well, friend, Do you know what I mean? Like there's not, like I've eaten in what is considered the greatest restaurant in the world. It was expensive, but it wasn't like the cost of a house. And if you want that to be house. your thing, that can be your thing. Yeah. Or, you know, like I, I've i flown it first class. I've uh, I've been on a private jet before. You know, like it, you, you, you get this sense that like, oh, everything would change uh, if you got to this level. And it's like, yeah, in the sense that you would do a lot of these unusual things more often, but they're not that different than things that you could experience now. And once you experience them, you go, that was cool. Uh, I don't know if it's worth orienting my entire life and making every one of my decisions uh, uh, around being in a position to do that all the time. By the way, I know people who do all these things on a regular basis. Yeah. There's very few of the things that are actually worth it where it moves the needle. Yeah. I think having a nice big house that can ho- that can house your ex- family when, when they visit, yeah. that's one of those things. I'm not convinced flying private is one all the time is one of those things, but that could be borderline one of those things. Besides that, I'm pretty sure... Uh, maybe some services like uh, cleaning and... Uh, but besides that... There's not a huge list of things that I actually think moves the needle uh, that you could have on a daily basis. Um, our friend Nathan Barry has this blog post. I forget what it was called, but he basically like documents. He's like, you know what's crazy is that Jeff Bezos and me have the same laptop. Yes. We have the same iPhone. We have the same. We're probably going to use a lot of the similar software. Like I can build many of the things that he's able to build. Like we have, it, it's 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 almost democratized. Like what we have access to, and that's actually a really cool idea. I think. No, it's very cool. And then, and then, yeah, you, you go, oh, okay. Like it's not so, so the, so the only reason to do it is, is the delusion that it somehow proves something or makes you superior to other people, which it, which doesn't. We, um, so I have this company called Hampton, which is like, it's an a CEO group, whatever. And we did a survey amongst them. And we, we did, we call we do surveys all the time where we create cool content for them. Cause we like, you know, we'll have like 500 people who run an e-commerce company and yeah. we'll be like, what's your monthly spend on Facebook and what's your, what's your return right now? And so we'll just share it with everyone. We did this one called the wealth survey where we asked them about income expenses, net worth, what their goals are, um, uh, a variety of things. Yeah. And what was interesting is we had a bunch of people ranging from 10,000 a month in spend all the way up to $200,000 a month in spend. This is personal spend. Yeah. And both the groups of people, it seemed had about equal. So we asked them like happiness and like how like satisfied are you? So both groups of people had similar amounts of happiness and both groups of people were like, it doesn't even feel like that much money that I'm spending. Yeah. And like, 
and like the higher end guys they had this like we'd ask them um they could like type in anything they wanted in the comment section and they'd be like man i just added up how much i spend like i'm shocked like it doesn't even like i feel middle class like i don't yeah. even spend that much and i thought that was crazy that you could spend like with this one guy who spends 100 grand a month he's like it's not even that much money and i'm like well that is a lot of money but that's yeah. crazy that you think that because it must not tr- like you you're not spending it effectively or something yeah. or or it just won't change that much past like maybe 20 grand a month is plenty good versus 150 and it was just insane to hear these people say they spend these numbers and they're like it doesn't feel like a lot it is helpful to realize like one most people have no idea what they're doing uh two most people are not happy these are people who are more successful than you so most people who are very successful you're looking up to or whatever they don't know what they're doing they're not happy uh, and also things are not what they seem. I was talking to uh, Molly Bloom. and uh, She's uh, Molly's game? Yeah, yeah, the, the poker player. So she ran this illegal underground poker game for many years. She probably hung out with the richest, most unhappy yes. people on earth. Totally. And uh, we were talking about someone we knew and uh, who seemed to live a very lavish lifestyle. And I was like, how is that possible? Like, I know that business. How is that business possible? Like, how how, how is that possible? As I was like, it's not adding up. Right. I wasn't necessarily comparing myself to it, but I was like, how am I doing something wrong that I should be having that if we're in similar business? And she goes, you know, it's always worth remembering they could be criminals. And I was like, oh, in my in my mind, in my frame of reference, everyone's doing everything above board. Everything's legitimate because like, of course, they're right. They're paying taxes as they should yeah. be. They're paying their employees on time. But but from her perspective, having experienced a different world, right, like literally the underworld and then also like people who are degenerate gamblers or criminals or 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 just like living way outside their means. She was just like, it, it was just a totally different lens on thinking about it. It's like, oh it could literally be all smoke and mirrors. Like it, none of it could be real. Um, and uh, it could all come crashing down at any moment. And that was like really helpful to me because now I, I, I just sort of, uh, I don't do it in a judgy way. I do it in a way that's letting me off the hook. When I see something, I just go like, I have no idea what's happening there behind the scenes, but it could be the opposite of what it appears. And I'm just gonna like focus on my stuff. Who have you met? Like which heroes or people you've looked up to have you met and they've lived up to the hype that you created in your head and you've thought to yourself this person has nailed it i really admire and like not that you trade with them but you're like that's something to build to that is a good life that's That's, a life worth living i would say first though that that idea like you realize there are almost no people that you would trade places with of course right so so when you're jealous or when you're insecure you're comparing yourself to other people you have to you have to remind yourself you can't do partial trades like it's a it's all or nothing right like you got to live inside that head and you have to think about things the way they think about them. you don't get to have your values your perspective your, your knowledge your age you don't get to have any of that other stuff it's the whole kit and caboodle and it's suddenly the trade doesn't look so attractive there's there you're trying to you're trying to have what you have and what they have but i'm right? sure you've hung out with people where you're like they're they're nailing it. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm just saying. Like, I think it's worth it's worth pointing out that like, that's the that's the stupidity of of jealousy is that like you find when you really look at it. Yeah, it's all you, bullshit. You would almost never like, trade places when you read that Elon Musk biography. Like, I've refused to read it because um, I don't really love him, but I respect his work. But I like. I've read the excerpts and I'm like, this sounds like the most high stress. Like, I was it like, sounds I, like it's horrible. I was like, I don't want to, wanna, I don't, I don't want to read a scary book. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, no. It's a, it sounds like it's absolutely horrible to be him. And that, it, that all of it comes at a very high cost. Oh yeah. Uh, for sure. Uh, yeah. I think there's people I've met here or there that I would go, Oh, that they seem like they're doing it right. It's also, I, I try not to like call people out specifically. Cause I also feel like not that it's unfair, but like, I'm sure it's, I'm sure they're dealing with shit in their own life sure, sure, and, sure. and they, they don't want to be held up as like the perfect person who's got I'm not it, saying like, perfect. It I'm just being like, you got a good handle on things. Like you're doing all right. I really, I, I admire. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and it's funny though. Like when, what are the things that tend to make you feel that way about someone? It's not, it's normally like, what's their marriage? Like do, do their kids like them? Yeah. You know, like how chill is their life? You know, like how, how good do they seem? It's, it's not normally like, no, no, this guy could throw the ball further than this no, guy. It's... Or th- this woman is more beautiful than that woman. It's It usually comes down to things that are really cheap. I, I So I live like out in the country most of the time. And I remember I was, this, some, at some point during the pandemic, I was walking down the road to my house. And I my house is 
it was cheap comparative to what it's worth now because everything in Austin blew up. But like, uh, you know, my my house wasn't cheap. Uh, it's more than most people could afford. And, but I was thinking like, what do I like about it, right? Like, and I live on a I live on literally a dirt road. Many of my neighbors are trailers. You know, uh, I have more land than most of my neighbors. Uh, I have a nicer house than most of my neighbors. But I was like, what do I love about like where I live? Uh, what are the things? And it's like, I love the way the sun sets and the way it rises. I love uh, like that it is a dirt road and like it can't ever be a paved road. You know, I love like the, I love the deer that wander around. I love, I love all the things about it that my neighbor who is living in a trailer also gets. Right. And, and, and sort of remembering that the, the things that are actually valuable uh, or that you appreciate or provide most of the meaning or happiness are not the expensive, fancy things uh, is, is really important. And I think you see that with people too. Like the things you admire about them are not the things that they paid for or the yeah, things I that mean, were hard to acquire. It's like so, character and kindness and, you know. Have you met um, Laird Hamilton? Uh, I've met um, his I, wife. His wife, yeah. Laird came on our podcast because I was a huge fan of his. He's a person who I think like I admire so I he has so many qualities that I admire. The way that they built this home and they it's like become a, a center of community. I love that. The way that he prioritizes family and surfing and then like business is like number four or five or six. Uh-huh. I'm just like I admire that guy a lot. Um I admire um do you know Rob Rob Deerdick? Yep. We had him on the pod and I'm a I, I skateboard as well. And when they pitched us to him, I'm like I don't want a fucking skateboarder coming yeah. on here. And then he came on and he blew my mind. Like yeah, yeah, how like dialed in. He doesn't in. skateboard anymore though. No, no, not even. Uh, And he's so dialed in to like, and I'm not dialed in like that at all. And I don't want to be like that. But I like, he was like, I like to spend this much time with my family. I'm only going to work from nine to five. And I know like, and then from noon to one, we'll have lunch. Like he's dialed in. And I really, and he's got a really positive outlook on life. I, yeah. And I appreciate him. Um, But I think those two guys are who I've talked to where I'm like, I respect the shit out of you. Also, um, Darmesh, the guy who founded um, HubSpot. The uh-huh. of, have you ever talked to that guy? No. Dude, but he bought your company, right? He bought my company. He's a billionaire, which which is cool. But what I'm what I'm like, he like is like, hey, I'm teaching my kid how to code. So we made this website, and the it's like a game website, and it's like now really popular. And like, I just like appreciate these family men yes. who are loyal to their wives. It's one of the reasons why I love John Rockefeller. He's one of the few people who I've read about who was mostly honest. Uh-huh. He only lied like one or two times like publicly where it was like blatantly like, dude, that's a lie. You just lied. He was loyal to his wife the whole time. He was a little tough on his children, but in general, he was a wonderful father. And so I try, I seek out these like guys. So like, um, I, I think on your suggestion, I read Patriarch, Joe Kennedy. Oh, I, I, I don't think I recommended that book, but I, I'm familiar with Joe Kennedy. Horrible guy. The worst. The worst. Uh, but like I wanted him to be awesome. And so like, yes. it, it's actually quite rare to find these people that meet this traditional, uh, when you see the trauma of that family continuing to this moment, yeah, it's like you wouldn't trade it for any like, of that. Like why is, why is Robert F. Kennedy Jr. a piece of shit? It's cause Joe Kennedy was a piece of shit. Yeah, it continues down to this day. It's crazy. And so like, I look for these characters that like are mostly awesome, like mostly well-rounded, good, sure. good men. There's, and there's not a significant amount of, amount of them who have, books that are also fun to read uh but like rockefeller's one of them um i think he only lied like a few times and uh he was a good he seemed like a good husband yes uh but well what's interesting about rockefeller speaking of trauma is like his dad sucked his dad was so horrible you, you, it's not that you grade what people they call on him, a, slick willy or something yeah it's not that you grade people on a curve but the idea that uh he seemed to do better than you would expect from where he came from I think you have to give some people some credit there. Yeah, and there's not a lot. So, like, some of the books I, I've seen you recommend, you love the Lyndon B. Johnson series, right? Uh-huh. Uh, he was kind of not that great of a guy. Oh, no, I don't think that that book is celebrating him as a great dude. No, I don't think so either. Yeah. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, you, uh-huh. you've recommended a lot of books by him. Dude, he fucking bailed on his kid. Like, his, I believe um, his wife gave birth to the kid. The wife died that day, and the, his mother died that day in the same home. Yes. And weeks later, he bounces to the Dakotas or whatever for like 15 months or something yes. like that. And it's like, you're a great American and you did all these great things, but like, 
fucking bailed on your your kid like that's messed up so like it's it's interesting to like see like all these people i admire and then to see all the flaws that come with them and it's actually hard to find a lot of people who you're like that's the way to live yeah i mean how many u.s presidents were not absolute garbage people or complete psychopaths like it's probably you could narrow it down to 10 and then you could debate those 10 right you we know? always say uh i always say um all great men are are evil men all great men are bad men meaning in order to be great you know like great at the if they level build a statue of you chances are you did some real fucked up shit yeah and i remember like someone was like well i like obama i'm like okay cool you can like him but i bet you like those people who got droned like <laughs> Don't you know what I mean? Like in order to like achieve greatness, it also takes a while. It's too early to. I mean, look, it doesn't always take a while. Sometimes you know someone's a monster from the beginning. Well, you don't have to be a monster to also be bad. No, no, but I'm saying sometimes like the rottenness of the person is obvious from day one, and then sometimes you find the the secret that they're hiding or the secret life or you know whatever actually wasn't great about them only a small circle of people knew about, right? It took time. It took time to be revealed. And like Obama's still living. So I, I think he's pretty great. But well, I, I think I'm he's a saying, great guy. Yeah. But what I mean is like, you don't know. you're going to piss people off. Yeah, along, of like you, you, you're not, in order to achieve anything on a large scale, there are going to be a lot of unhappy people with you. Right, because you're making decisions. I mean, look, he's, he's the president of America, not the president of the country that he's droning. Right. Right. And so that's the, that you have this, that that's the problem with being a leader is that you you're make, you're leading one group of people not all groups of people and, and so I you're think, making decisions that involve uh, a, a weighing of interests which inherently leads to uh, you know at that level um, treating human beings as not as valuable as other human beings yeah and maybe that that's a big takeaway for this for this episode which is like I've like. I've been so fortunate to like meet all these badass people. So have you, people I admire, and uh, and uh, there's weaknesses in all of them. Like, what? Do you yeah, eat? of course. What are you eating here? Oh, uh, it's just a mint of caffeine. This is caffeine. Yeah. How much? Uh, I think two is a cup of coffee. Two is one cup of coffee. Yeah. You drink caffeine? No. I don't drink coffee. I don't drink coffee. So this, this isn't gonna make me anxious or jittery. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, this, I didn't mean for this to be a, a an ad for Neuromint, but um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I I I don't uh, I don't do coffee, I don't do soda, so it's you the drink only, only way. No, I don't drink either. Why not? I was an alcoholic. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, when did you get sober? Um, I was intoxicated every day from like the age of twenty to like the age of twenty three. Okay, twenty four hours a day. Um. Yeah, it was pretty bad. I, I, I went to jail. Bad. Yeah, it sucked. Um, and then I think it was at age 23 or 24, I was like, I went cold turkey and I got um, withdrawals. I got hospitalized because you start getting seizures and stuff. Uh, so it was like an, it was an ordeal. Other than the consequences, what helped you get sober? It's, it's fucking cringe when I say it, but I was watching this concert. It was Oasis. Uh huh. I was watching on YouTube. Oasis is famous because they threw the biggest concerts. They kind of yeah. invented this like huge big concert thing in yeah. England. And there was like a hundred thousand people there. It was one of the biggest concerts in the world. And I saw Noel Gallagher barely singing. He was singing very lightly. You know, he wasn't that loud of a singer, but the 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 sound was um, was so loud, and all these people were singing back to them. And I was like, this guy's exerting so little energy, and he's getting so much energy back, and having such a big impact. I think I have the ability to, to do that, but I'm a fucking loser right now. I'm sitting here intoxicated. Yeah. I just got out of jail. I'm just a total fucking loser. And I remember like having that feeling. I'm like, I got to get my shit together. And so I had a bunch of false starts. And then eventually I just it took like six weeks or something. And I just locked myself in a room and just got over it. Um, it was pretty hard. Um, but that happened. And then I got arrested one time. I got like arrested like two or three times. I got arrested one time and I spent 24 hours in jail. And my dog was left alone in my house and I got home and he had shit all over the house. And I'm like, dude, I just totally failed you, man. I'm so sorry. You're my responsibility. And I let you down. And I just felt like my heart was broken. And so like those two things like got my act together. And you just did it uh, total willpower. White no, the first you... time I did, but then I got hospitalized and I was like, screw it. I'm going to, I'm getting back on it. And then the second time I was like, I'm doing this. And I just like 
bought like a blood pressure machine to make sure it wasn't getting too high because the first time I got hospitalized from blood pressure issues, um, and I just like monitored it and I was like, I'm. Just but I'm, I'm just saying, you 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 did it like you went to rehab or you no you did no 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 no, no. I went to AA a couple times, but no, I just um, took three or four weeks off of of life and I just stayed at home for. A and what you, and what allows you to stay sober just, again just pure discipline or yeah 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 do you feel like you're on the edge always or no. you feel like it's no well i feel like if i like go to the hospital like for example i have kidney stones and like if they give me pain pills i'm like i can only have three like you can give me one now i'll take one home my wife can have the other one and or they'll, they'll, they'll give you like 60 of them yeah. and, and when we go get it and like sarah put the three in the bag go throw those away right now so i feel like i I could you can go down i feel like i don't crave alcohol anymore because i drink non-alcoholic beer that helps a ton um but i have a propensity to be addicted to things i'm i i do nicotine so i like to uh, suck on zen um and then for a long time i was it was sugar was my thing where i was just like i'll just eat as much candy as i want that and i'll address that at a later date in order to help me get off alcohol no no i think I, i have the exact whatever whatever the thing that makes someone an addict I have, uh, and then, you know, we all have our traumas, whatever, whatever might've been a, a sort of a more profound trauma or experience that might've sealed it early for me. I feel like lucky enough to have escaped, but then I, I feel like if it is possible to get addicted to a thing, I can get addicted to that thing. I can do that. And thing it's important to know that. And yeah. And it's, it's luck you, to, to be able to know that about yourself is, is a thing that I think a lot of people have to blow up their entire lives to be able to figure out. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I, su- I sort of feel like I'm, I'm always, it's just better not, I just, uh, bet, I, for me, I'm like a, a better not person. Yeah, like, I and I think that that's that. important to realize. I think that if I had a bet, I'm from Missouri. So I live in New York a little bit. I live in San Francisco and Austin. All three are like yuppie, health conscious places. Yeah. The middle America, middle America of the South, like the normal part of the country, I actually would gay, if I had a bet, I would say 35% are alcoholics. I think it's like way more common than people yes. realize. They don't call it alcoholism. Because but it, the society functions around making that seem normal. Yeah, I think young people now drink way less. So it's actually different amongst yeah. young people. But older people, the, the 40 to 60 year olds, I think going to the bar after work is quite normal. I think that more people than you realize do what I used to do, which is you wake up and you chug beers before you get out of bed. Yeah. I think that happens. That's far more common, I think, than most people realize. So I think like the the it's pretty crazy how many people are addicted to something. Yes. Um, particularly now, um, pharmaceuticals. So uh-huh. like whatever that is. I mean, I used to love that shit too. I mean, it's awesome. It makes you feel awesome uh-huh. until it doesn't. But I think like a large percentage a percentage of America is actually would be a true addict. Um, but people don't talk about it, uh, that much, but yeah, anyway, I had issues and also like meeting a great woman helps. I think you have this blog post where you say like, um, what was your blog post about your wife? It was, um, the best life hack on earth is who you pick. Uh Is that what it was? Something like that. Yeah. Um, I firmly believe that to be true. So like getting a good woman or a good man where it's one plus one equals three that like makes life a thousand times better. I think as a rule, you're talking about the, how rare it is to find like a successful, powerful or whatever person you admire almost to a, to a, a person. There is another person involved in that equation. And that's why they either didn't go over to the dark side or why they didn't, you know, make this mistake or that mistake or what, you know, like I, I would say, I, I think quite unequivocally, being married ties you down. Like it ties in you down. In a good way. Yes, in a good way. It ties you down to reality, which if you are a successful, ambitious, and then at some point famous or well-known or well-respected person or extremely talented person, um, you are very susceptible to being puffed up, to floating away, to becoming unmoored uh, because you are lacking uh, those uh, the ballast that, you know, holds a normal person down. And so you, you almost need it more than ever. Well, the way that I, the visualization I have in my head is a lot of people who like to achieve, we're just cars with our back wheels jacked up and the, we're going pedal the metal. And what you have to do, and it helps when you have a good partner is you got to like set that car in the right direction and then pull the plug and boom, you can go. Uh-huh. And for me, I, I was going in that direction. So like, up until recently, I still like 
I used to sleep on the street sometimes. Like I literally thought I was going to be a homeless person. I thought I was going to be a homeless person in jail. That's what because I, you were drinking so much. Yeah, and I was yeah. just like, I'm going to be a criminal. Like this, yeah. is, like I just want to party. This sure. is like my life. And like I remember, there'd be times I'd wake up on a bench, and I'm like, the fuck, where wow. are we? Okay. Or like when I got to San Francisco, I used to sneak on the bus because I didn't have any money. Yeah. Like and like I was just like, I'm just going to be a vagrant. Like yeah. this is just my life. And so you have to like get if you're this car that's moving fast, you gotta get it help. You gotta figure out something to get pointed in that right direction. Otherwise, if you get too far down that path, you're fucked. And I think that if you do get too far down that too far down that path, there is no turning back. I mean, have you ever met someone who recovered from heroin? Like most of them are still messed up in some capacity. Sometimes it works. A lot of times it doesn't. I I have this story in the in the book that I'm writing now, the Justice one. Uh, do you know the story of Bunk Mister Bunk Mister Fuller? the architect so he's sort of he's failing as an architect he's just been kicked out of harvard he's a drinking problem he just buried one of his children and he's staring out over lake michigan and he's like i'm just gonna swim out there far enough until i drown he's just gonna like kill himself he's like standing on the edge of it just sort of contemplating like what a loser he is uh the mistakes that he's made that it's sort of all over for him and he hears this voice and the voice basically says like how dare you he's like how dare you think this belongs to you That's right and his, his, uh not just because he had children but but the uh, what he took the voice to mean was like you have potential you have gifts you have the potential to contribute to humanity you have the obligation to co- and you're to, fucking to, blowing it uh, yeah to contribute to humanity and not just have you blown it up until this point you're about to 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 blow it all up right like you're about to to quit instead of realizing that potential and that voice sort of brings him back from the edge and he goes on to be this sort of fascinating you know sort of in- influential character and hopefully you know we'd say also sort of makes it right with his kids and his spouse and his family and, and is just also like a nice decent human being uh, maybe that's too much to ask i don't know but the, the idea is like it doesn't belong to you like you have as i think anyone with gifts or potential or talent you that comes with certain obligations um, so I, like, I know well, writers. I, and that's why I think getting married is awesome. There's we have a lot of friends, you and I, mutual friends who are I call them Peter Pans. Yes, they're, they're children. They're 43 year old men who are single. And if you're single because you haven't found the right person, oh yeah, cool. Sure. But sometimes I think, well, you're not settling down because you want you're like missing. You feel like you're going to be held back, and that's loser talk. Yes. That that means you have the wrong person, um, yes. and that's the wrong attitude. If you want to be single, be single. But right. that that reason, and so a lo- what a lot of our friends will do is they turn to psychedelics. Yes, and I'm like, you know what would be a much better psychedelic? Have a kid, <laughs> or get a dog. Yeah. Do anything where other people rely on you, and so you are now thinking to yourself, not I am lost. You are thinking, I need to provide for this. Yes, I need to give to others, and that is a significantly better, I think, experience. I'm actually in favor of. I don't do any drugs. I, I don't do psychedelics. I'm in favor in some cases of that, sure. but in general, I think that people go to go too far down that path, and I'm like. Dude, just have like someone that relies on you and you will feel better. I, I just I don't like the idea that there's some magical solution to your existential problems. Uh, right. Like uh, the question of what gives life meaning or how do you make sense of pain or failure or adversity or grief or mistakes that you've made in your life? Like welcome to the human condition like humans have been wrestling with that exact thing for as long as there have been human beings and the idea that you can have some shaman in peru like mix a paste for you and then they'll magically go away i think like some of that posturous i've never done that stuff i imagine it could be one tool in the toolbox you know like i do but like i've got a bunch of friends that are veterans and they're like i had huge issues and this has helped like help me come to terms with some of the trauma i'm like all right I, i agree i think that's awesome but uh I, I tweeted this out and I got shit on a lot where I'm like, all you people that are doing psychedelics, like have children or something like think beyond who you are or have employees or do something where it's yeah. like, I have to serve others. So it's no longer about be what am adult. I put down roots, be an adult, do adult things and, uh, get comfortable with that. Yeah, I agree. Look, if you have profound, uh, uh, untreatable traumas, uh, by all means, experiment with that because the other things that they have you experiment with are also super heavy. Uh, but if you can't figure out why, you know, uh, scrolling on on Tinder every day isn't doing it for you, and why success, financial success hasn't done it for you, and fame hasn't done it for you, 
Um, and you just think this is finally going to be the thing that is doing it for you. I think you're just fooling yourself and you're being obnoxious. And then worse, worse, what I really don't like about it. And again, I know people who are serious about it. They support like actual research in it and uh, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not talking about that, but I am very disturbed by the casualness with which people have, who have zero medical training, uh, tell other people that drugs are the solution to their problems. You know what I mean? Like there is this weird tendency, especially among broken people, um, to uh, find something and then tell everyone else that it's the solution to their problems uh, when really they're just projecting and trying to convince themselves have you ever done that it? they have solved their problems. No. I've done <clears throat> shrooms when I was like partying, but I've never done any of that stuff medicinally. I, I've done it one time, shrooms one time. Med never like medicinally uh i refuse to do any of it it's just yeah, not I'm, I, I, I'm i'm i i'm i'm gonna fall off the cliff like i feel like i'm like i can't do any of this stuff but i respect some in some cases i respect it but i i, Look, I will I'm, never do it. I'm reluctant to fuck with your brain chemistry uh which i believe can't be unfucked once it's been fucked with and then i think we're all also because we either and this is more a problem like in the sort of community you and i are in uh, because we don't want to be judgmental. Uh, we don't want to like call anyone out publicly. Um, uh, I think we're all just dancing around the fact that a bunch of these people have lost their fucking minds and it's all traceable back to that. Uh, and they're not even just like nuts. Like they're doing horrendous things to people around them and then also to society with the nonsense that they're spreading. So like, I, I think it, it like, uh, I think sort of the proof is in the pudding, uh, when you, when you look at the impact it's had on the lives of the people who do it a lot, right? The people were like, I did it once and it, I got over this thing with my parents and I told them I loved them and now we're good. Like, sure, whatever. I don't have a problem with that. With well, the person who is like becomes the evangelist and the guru about it, I am, I, I struggle to come up with a case in which it did not end horribly. Yeah. So it's like polygamy or, yes. or, or, yeah, the or people an open are relationship. Yes. I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to end well. If you think it's going to do, you should do whatever makes you happy. But also you should just shut the fuck up about it. And <laughs> uh, like, let's see how it works. Exactly. Um, do you have any vices? I have a ton of vices. Like what? Like any chemical? Uh, any chemical vices? No, probably those mints are the only the the only substance I take on a consistent basis. That like, you know, in a perfect world, I would not take. But... Do you scroll your on your phone a lot? Uh, yes. Uh, I I have a phone that has Instagram on it. Um, that I, you know, like have at my house that I don't like carry around with me, and sometimes I like. Sometimes I'll get sucked down a rabbit hole. My wife will be like, you're browsing more than you want to be. And I'll be like, I'll just throw it. Is your browsing like entertainment or like fitness people or what? Uh, no, I think I'm, I'm, it's more just like mindless, funny, like silly stuff, silly, stupid stuff. And then, and then I tell myself, uh, one out of a hundred things comes up with something cool that I do for daily still. That's, that's what like I say good. Too. So, so, you know, that's I, what I that, say about Twitter. No Twitter. Twi Twitter is the worst. I mean, look at look at what Twitter has cost Elon Musk in every way. And I go, that is worse than. Heroin. So you don't use Twitter at all. Uh, I have not logged on or touched Twitter in many, many years. Every once in a while, I'll, there'll be a link to something on Twitter that I want to see. And someone will link to me. And then because he broke it and now you can't see whole threads. Yeah, I go, oh, yeah, fuck. And then I close it. That's so funny. I, I think Twitter has broken more successful people I admire than psychedelics. So I um I um it's happened about five times where I've worked with someone as a, on a just I'm friends with them. They're either very wealthy, yeah, or they are a professional athlete, or whatever they are. They're like just the best, you know. And but they're not popular on the internet. Yeah. So um maybe I'll name one person like um Chris Pronger. So Chris okay. Pronger, famous hockey player. He's okay. like the second or third highest earning hockey player of all time. Okay. But that was like 20 years ago and he's hockey's not terribly popular, whatever, he's successful. And, and they're like, Hey, I want to get popular on Twitter. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, dude, I'll just help you write this a handful of things and I'll just tell you how it works. They do it and it blows up. Yeah. And I'm like, 
don't fall down this trap. You have won already. You yeah. don't need this. And they all get addicted to it. Yes. Where they're like, I want more. I'm like, dude, I only have an audience and I'm only trying to be popular online because I had, this is the only, this it is the br- skill set I had and it makes my, I have to do it for my job. You don't need this job. Don't sign up for it. Of all the mediums, it's also the least conducive to growth or development, right? Because it's the, the smallest space it's uh encourages certainty and immediacy and it is the most inherently i think antagonistic uh and so i think it's all downside and almost no upside i would disagree there is upside i think that that like you can find smart people and you could get inside their you could hear their thoughts so instagram is picture based so it's what you look i can take a picture that makes me artificially look good it's much harder to hide bad ideas and good writing and it exists out there. But but good writing is inherently not done in the medium that is Twitter. No, that's nonsense. That's oh, you're only saying that because Thre- threaded writing is the is the is a medium inherently not conducive to good thinking. And that is why like think about it, right? Like Twitter and or sorry, Instagram, the other social networks exist because they made it possible to do a thing that like literally was not possible to but do you're all, you're putting value on long being good no I'm, I'm i'm saying that the way the mind works and the way that ideas are best communicated uh human beings have been experimenting with writing for thousands of years right and there's a reason we don't communicate to each other in like 140 character chunks or that we don't communicate to each other in like weird threaded writing. There's a reason we developed the mechanisms by which we communicate because it engenders good thinking from the people doing the thinking and then it requires reflection and uh, you know um, consideration from the person reading it. I think the medium of Twitter of like react to something in real time or even just express what you're thinking as you're thinking it is by definition bad thinking. I'll let me give you a counter example. There's a guy I love. He's one of my favorite people to follow. So I don't follow too many business people. I don't follow news. I don't pay attention to the news. There's a guy named uh, Die Workwear, um, and it is all about fashion and the history of fashion. Yeah. This morning, or not this morning, a few months ago, a month ago, he wrote this amazing post about um, how uh, the Japanese. So you like uh, like vintage American fashion. Yeah. The best shits from Japan now. Have you ever noticed that? Okay. So like, like I've got fancy jeans on that are American jeans. They're actually made in Japan. Yeah, and, sure. And so he did this amazing post where he t- explained how um, Japan, when we when the Americans occupied them after World War II, Japan thought the Americans were going to slaughter them. The Americans were actually pretty kind. They like yeah. we're going to try and like make you guys love us. So hopefully we don't have fights again, whatever. And so because of that, the Japanese were like, all right, cool, let's be friends. I love that fashion, and it warped into this American fashion plus Japanese craftsmanship and created this amazing like uh, new genre of fashion. He wrote this whole thread on this. It was 2,000 words. I was like so inspired that I went and bought this book called How Japan Saved American Fashion. I read it. I learned all about uh, culture, the culture of Japan. It was amazing. And I that was all, for, all because of Twitter. So I don't know how you could like dismiss it as like there's no But upside. I mean, you just described what blogging is or yes. what articles are. Right. But so, so you can get those outside of Twitter. And that's where I, I would say... Uh, that's where I would consume my information, and that the, the 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 fact that there is some non garbage on Twitter is not an argument for why one would spend time on. Twitter. No, but it is an argument that there is upside along with some. You said you said there is no up. There's virtually I'm, I'm, no upside yeah, and yeah, all I, downside. What, what I'm saying is that inherently the medium <laughs> is is designed to compress and distort thinking. So even when you see good stuff, that stuff would have been better in another medium. Right, so yeah, I, out, out, that would have been better out, outside of the Twitter algorithm or or the Twitter culture. And so, like, I feel very fortunate to have been able to live in a time where discoverability, like, Twitter is where, like, Billy, who who works for me, Billy Oppenheimer. Uh, oh, is that him back here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love Billy. Yeah, I know great. his work. He lives in a world where to to break out as a writer, a thinker, like that was you Billy have... back there. Yeah, yeah, Billy, I love your shit, man. I follow you. I think you're great. No, he's great. I'm just saying, like that is not where I. I think that's a wicked environment to develop as a thinker and to win attention as a thinker. And so, like, I, I think if you can avoid being on it and if you can avoid consuming on it, 
it's almost certainly better for your mental health, your brain develop all across the board. I think it's the it's the again, it's the most I think it's the most toxic. And this is demonstrated by the fact that it not only ruined Elon Musk before he bought it, but it's something broken in the algorithm literally made him light. 20 30 billion dollars yeah, on well, fire insane. it broke his it broke his brain in every way you can imagine if you're a young person listening to this here's what i think they should do um the era from like 05 to like 15 of blogging was so good that's right all that stuff still exists and you can and go so back and still exists yeah. and so you need to go back and read it and so yes. i use web archive all the time to go back and look at websites and how they used to be and I, you could actually find old blog posts yes that's how i found you was through thought catalog yeah which sure. isn't even a thing anymore. no they 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 bought a column for me every week for like two years or something so i liked that and then i also liked um um you know what was crazy is ryan holiday and gavin mckinnis were on the same blog like I mean, there's another person who is who is broken by the algorithm. Probably Twitter. I mean, that's what rat he. I knew Gavin because he was an advertiser. Uh, American Apparel would advertise in uh, Vice. In Vice, and he was sort of. Is he actually? Up. I think he's a performance artist, or is he actually insane? I mean, I think he was uh, an interesting thinker, and then kind of had a performance artist, and then I think there's a that saying like uh, fame is a mask that eats the face. I think it revealed underneath like real bigotry and awfulness and a, sort of a fascistic impulse. And he created a literal gang that was <laughs> instrumental in literally attempting to overthrow the United States government. So if you want to talk again about how sort of being terminally online and like fighting in culture war issues online and sort of responding to what gets engagement and whatever what that can do to a person i mean like well his story is insane. it fucking broke him and then he in turn nearly broke the united states well like his whole thing so i used to read him on thought catalog and i used to watch his videos and he was a really good writer yeah he's very funny. um and he's very funny and you read his old vice stuff and you're like oh you push the you push the limit sure. and i always thought of him as a comedian as well as an artist who just gets off on pushing the limit which i love those types of people and then i was like Wait, what's Proud Boys? Like, oh, that's funny. You're, it's a joke. Yeah. It's a misogynistic club. It's like a club. social club that turns into and then a it, gang. And then it becomes a thing. And, and I have no idea. I've never, I don't listen to him anymore. But I was always in my head. I was like, I think this guy just started a gag. And it just like, it, well, another great, it do you took know who, off. Do you know who J.P. Sears is? Yeah. He's like, has the red hair. Yeah, and he, the he, woke he, thing. Yeah, he started this. He started on all the different social networks as basically a parody yeah, the wig. of like extreme like uh sort of woo woo like uh yoga and then he bought into free. it well no and then and then he became this person who performed for the algorithm so he'd make fun of like whatever was in the moment but it became like surfing the algorithm and and being like like uh you know sort of making fun of stuff and getting attention kind of became his personality and then he became during the pandemic like you know what horseshoe theory is where you he just went from one end of the horseshoe all the way to the other end of the horseshoe and is like a monstrous moron like i, I say that in the sense of like he's very stupid but the things he is stupid about have monstrous impacts on on society and the world and that like that's what happened that's what like these things are uh i think much more dangerous than people want to talk about and they yeah. and they they can like audience capture is very real and it can fuck with you. And, and just like when I, as I've been doing this for 20 years now, I've watched people go from like, Oh, they're very normal. Blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, Holy shit. I can't believe I once knew that person. And then you're like watching what they do at the, it's crazy. But that era, right when you were coming up of Oh five to like 15, I think that was like a little bit, not quite pre-social, but almost yes. if you're young and you're listening to this, try and find all those blog posts yeah. those blog posts that i used to read those all the time like the whole idea of a blog roll where you would see at the bottom ryan and you would just subscribe these to these people and, and it just was talk so them, yeah. good i like the, the writing and the creation i think like people talk about creators nowadays yeah. or creator or what are they called just creators yeah and i way prefer like these bloggers it it's was a better medium nerdy people really nerdy sometimes hermit style people <laughs> 
but they it was less pranks or whatever YouTube is yeah. and these like really interesting, well thought out posts. And so yeah. I go to Hacker News every day. Do you ever go to Hacker uh -huh. News? So Hacker News is still like a like a Yeah, they're like, check out this article from this person you've never heard of. Yeah, and it's and all it's like eight thousand words on some super in depth topic and you're like, Oh, that's really cool. And yeah. maybe they that's all that person had in them. They never wrote anything good. After I that. loved it. Yeah. I loved it. I uh -huh. love that era of writing. That's one of my favorite eras. I'm doing, um, I'm doing, I'm going to do a chapter on that in my book now, like writing to think there's a reason Amazon, if you like have an idea or you want to call a meeting, you have to like write a long memo, yeah, like a six page memo. Yeah. Like Jeff Bezos doesn't say like do a, a 240 character summation of what we're going to no, talk about. No, 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 no. You have to spend some time to figure out what the fuck you're talking about and what you're thinking about. Yeah, because you can't hide bad ideas in writing. Yes. You'll very clearly see it's a bad but idea. But you can hide bad ideas in Twitter threads and or Instagram posts and in, in a one minute TikTok. Uh, you know, all, all those mediums are uh, deceptive because, you know, they say you can't call it an honest man, right? Like your audience is trying to... Sh hack the process they're trying to get like in-depth information in a very short period of time and so like i play with all those tools at daily stoke because I, I think I well can i do love it within... your youtube channel i think you because your your videos are like 18 and 25 minutes long sometimes yeah and whenever i watch them you have beautiful background music it feels like a movie Dawson um, makes all those. dude those are so good i watch them all the time but those are a lot of them are collections of shorter things yeah, yeah but they're the best i yeah. love them like i always do the ones um uh, there's like different like leadership ones and whatever yeah. like because I actually feel like I I do them when I when I go for walks I always listen to you because uh, uh, I put out a pay, uh, one of those just the audio of one of them each week on the podcast so I you don't even have to do that. it I yeah. always go to YouTube I forget which day of the week it is but one day of the week of the episode I do the the email I just read the email. Uh, and then uh, I just take the audio from one of the YouTube videos. Dude, it's the best. Runs. You did another one about um, like money and um, philosophers. Yeah, uh, that's so good. There is. <laughs> what, what are you laughing about? That no, I actually... that's funny. No, it's very nice. No, I listened to all of them. Uh, I, I like, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the of the Daily Stoic uh, the YouTube channel. Yeah, I like listen to so many of them. I've heard all of them. I, like I remember. Um, you used to, you, I always search for the ones where it's just like on one person. Yeah, I know. I need to make more of those. And you haven't done more of those. Lately, yeah. it's been aggregating um, like a variety of lessons to learn. I'm yes. like, no, no, no. I just want the deep dive on this one. All here, right, man. I'll do I wrote a whole book about this. You know? um, I, did, I did a book called Lives of the Stoics, which is bios of each of the Stoics. I, but for some reason, when you, I like your voice and I like the music that you have behind it. It's because it, it does a good job of uh, setting up tension and releasing tension. It's like a, it's like a little bit of a movie, you know what I'm saying? Yes, of course. And I thoroughly enjoy that. And usually they were like 15 to 25 minutes. And so like on a walk, I would do two. Uh, I, I love it. I, I really like the Daily Stoic. Um, which other videos did you do? Which ones have hit? Uh, like Stoic, I, we have, I think our most popular one is like, what the day of Marcus Aurelius might look like or, you know, specific themes, whether it's journaling or, uh, you know, talk, uh, I don't know. But like you would do someone like certain leaders as well, like yeah. different presidents. And like, you would tell me stories cause I'm a huge history buff. I read yeah. a shit ton of history and I, I would, uh, it basically was a history podcast that yeah. I was listening to. Well, you want to call this here and I'll show you some history books in the bookstore. Yeah. I'm done.